We want to welcome everybody who is watching online this morning. I know there are plenty of individuals that are. Some are traveling. Some are not feeling well. Some don't want to feel bad, and so they stay home. Whatever the reason is, we welcome you. How many had uh, extended family come and join you for Thanksgiving? Let me see your hand if you had extended family come and join you. How many were thankful for those family that came to join you? How many were thankful when they left? Any, anybody? Yeah. <laughs> it was, we had an extended family come, and they were awesome. It was a wonderful, wonderful time. It was a blessing. But, man, it's amazing how you don't realize how much, you know, energy you're putting into it. And when they leave, you're like, done, just like that turkey was on Thursday. You know, I, I was thinking about this because, uh, you know, we had people from, from all over. And, and I was looking at this message today. And, and you know, I, if I looked at what they are doing, I would say that uh, just about every one of them have been successful in whatever career God's given them, whatever calling God's placed on their life. And uh, I, don't, I don't know if I've ever met anyone who does not want to be successful I don't know if I've ever met anyone that says, you know what, I think my goal in life is to be a failure, to fail in life. I don't think I've ever met anyone like that. I don't think I ever will meet anyone like that. The problem with success and saying I want to be successful or having a successful life is that um, it's a very relative term. For some people, what some people would consider a success, others would deem it a failure. And so when we talk about success in life, when we talk about being successful in life, we have to recognize that there's only one place that will define success for us. There's only one person that can, can really define success for us. That's the Lord, right? That's God, the one who designed us, the one who created us. And, and the Bible is the one place that we will find what success really is about. It is the standard of definition of the definition of success. It is the only place that truly defines what success is. And what I love about the Bible is not just defines what success is, but it gives us examples, models of success. I don't know about you, but if I want to be successful in an area of life, I like to be able to find someone who actually has been successful in that pursuit. And then I can glean from them. I can learn from them. And one such person, obviously, that is our model for anything in life, and that's Jesus, right? Jesus is the ultimate model for everything. You know, when we want to know, um, you know how to deal with the, the losses of life, we look to Christ, right? When we want to look and see how do we deal with, with tough times, when, when things, you know, we, we had a pretty rough week this past week as a church family. And, and, and in the midst of that, I had to do what this, this series teaches us to do, and that's to choose joy. It wasn't going to come naturally. It wasn't going to come automatically for me. You know, there are people that I love very dearly that are suffering and have suffered or have passed. And, and, and it's hard, but you have to choose joy. It's a choice that we make. Otherwise, there's two choices. One is to let the circumstances of life pull you down and, 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 and define what, what, what success is, or you need to allow God to be the one to do that. And so when we look at Scripture, we see that whatever we go through in life, Jesus is our model for, for how we deal with life. What do we, how do we handle the things of life? But there's someone else that I have always, always looked to as a model, and that's the Apostle Paul. That's the one who wrote the book of Philippians, as well as probably half of the New Testament. But when we look at Paul, we see he was an incredible man. We see a man who, who understood what his calling was. He, we, he, we see a man who, who made his life count. He lived life to its fullest. He knew there was going to be a date. There was an, an expiration date to his life. Just like there's an expiration date to every one of our lives should Jesus tarry. Right? I mean, there's a day coming. Our days are numbered. Some, some of us understand when that's coming. Some of us don't. Some of it comes when we least expect it, but it's coming. And unless Jesus comes back and finds us alive, every one of us is going to reach that day. And so the question is not whether we're going to reach that day, but what do we do with the life that God gave us on this earth? Because that's what's going to define 
our success in eternity. That's what's going to define. And when we look at the Apostle Paul, man, he took every breath that God gave him as a born-again believer, a spirit-filled believer in Christ, a follower of Jesus, and he made the best out of everything he had. He took the bad, he took the good, he took the ugly, he took the beautiful, and he said, all of this is going to work for my good and for the glory of God. And in today's passage, you know, last week we looked at, uh, we started looking at chapter three and we saw, and we said that it was kind of like a biography of Paul, an autobiography of Paul. And we looked at what he did with his past and we saw what he did with his past regarding before he came to Christ and how he considered those things after he came to Jesus, how the, the, their normal worth uh, came into view when he came to Christ. Well, today we're going to look at what he's going to do and what he did with his presence, and, with his present and with his future. And I believe that we can glean a model of a successful life. Actually, he says this in the scriptures. He says, listen, follow my example. Do what I do. Think about that. How many of us could really with all confidence say, you know, just look at my life and do what I do. But Paul did that. And so we're going to learn from his life. We're going to learn what success really is, and we're going to learn how we can have a successful life from God's perspective, right? How many know that we belong to a different kingdom, right? And so in the kingdom of God, there is an incredible, uh, incredible success that we can have so that when one day when we stand before Jesus, we can hear those words, right? Well done, good and faithful servant. So if you have your Bibles there and you turn to, ch uh, to chapter three, I want you to stand for God, the reading of God's word this morning. I'm going to read verses 10, and I'm going to finish with the first, um, uh, first verse of chapter 4. But I'm going to begin in verse, chapter 3, verse 10. It says this. I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. If you want to turn there in your U version, New Living Translation. He says, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death. So that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection. But I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. But I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. And if you disagree on some point, I believe God will make it plain to you. But we must hold on to the progress we've already made. Dear brothers and sisters, verse 17, pattern your lives after mine. Everybody say that. Pattern your lives after mine. And he says, and learn from those who follow our example. For I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many who, whose conduct shows that they're really enemies of the cross of Christ. They're headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things, and they think only about this life here on earth. But we are citizens of heaven, where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. And we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. He will make our weak mortal bodies. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own. Can I hear a hallelujah regarding that, man? That's just awesome. Yeah. Using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. In verse 1 of chapter 4. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters... Stay true to the Lord. I love you and long to see you, dear friends, for you are my joy and the crown I receive for my work. So, Father, thank you for your wonderful word. It is a, a word that brings life, and may it do so in our hearts right now. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would take this word and make it a real in our lives, make it alive. God, let it change the way we see things, the way that we, that we perceive things, God. May it renew our thinking so that our lives can be transformed. And we'll be quick to give you the honor and the glory, Jesus. 
In your name and in the name of the Lord Jesus, Father, we come to you with honor and praise. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. You may be seated. I love what it says there in verse 17. I'm going to read it to you from the New International Version. It says this, and join together in following my example. That's verse 17, Philippians 3, 17. Join together in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we give you. Now notice what he does there. He says, listen, I've given you an example to follow, right? And then be based on my example and the example of those that I have been working with, we have now set a pattern for you to follow. And so you don't have to wonder how you need to live. You don't have to wonder what success looks like. You don't have to wonder what you need to do or I need to do in order for us to be successful in the kingdom of God because they have set the example for us. And in this example, in this life that Paul gives us, I see four keys to living successfully in the kingdom of God. There are many others, but in this passage here that we're going to look at today, based on his life and what he shares about his life, I believe we have four keys to a successful life in God's kingdom. How many want to be kingdom successful? Right? Not the way the world says, not what the world says is success, but what God's word defines as success, because that's what's going to really matter in eternity. So hear me, let me give you the first thing. If I'm going to be successful in my life, in the kingdom of God, this is what I need to do based on what Paul says. I continually evaluate my life. I continually evaluate my life. What does that mean to continually evaluate? Yeah, to continually evaluate, to constantly do it. Not to do it once a week or once a month or, you know what, we get to the end of the year and so we're going to look at New Year and we're going to evaluate. No, no, we need to continually allow the Holy Spirit to point th certain things out in our lives and we need to let him help us evaluate our lives. Look what he says. He says, not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it. He was very honest. He says, listen, guys, I know some of you may look at me and think I got it all together, but I don't. And there's still a whole lot I need to learn. And so this is where you and I admit that we don't have it all together. This is where we admit that we have a long way to grow still, that we haven't arrived, that we're not perfect. It means taking an honest inventory of our life. Everybody say honest. Because man, sometimes we filter it through our perceptions. We need to do it honestly. We listen before I need before I can know where I'm going. I need to know where I am. Anybody ever use Google Maps or Apple Maps or anything? You ever use any of those things? You know that the moment you put in an address, the first thing you see there's a little dot that shows you where you are, so that you can know where you're going. And so we want to know we're going to go. We want to go, but without knowing where we are, how are we going to get there? And Paul says this, and I, I have got my faults, man. I, I still have a lot to grow. Look what he says in verse 12 in the Good News Translation. It says it this way. I don't claim that I've already succeeded or have already become perfect. And to me, that's an amazing statement because Paul here is at the end of his life. He's an old man, right? And so he knows, listen, he knows that his time on this earth is short. And if anyone could have said... Dude, let me tell you about what I've experienced. It would have been Paul. The only man who ever went into the third heaven and actually saw things that he was forbidden to share. If it would have happened in the 21st century, there would have been a best-selling book right now. Things I saw in the third heaven. Buy it now. 
But he said, listen, I haven't. And he's the guy that wrote most of the New Testament, the guy who, who, who spread Christianity through the entire Roman Empire, who had an incredible impact on the world. We're here today because he said it's not just for Jews, it's for Gentiles. And we're here today understanding the grace of God that it's not by works that we're saved, but by the grace of God through our faith in Christ. All of that is because of Paul, and yet he's at the end of his life, and he says, I don't have it all together. I haven't arrived. I'm not perfect. I'm still growing. Here's the point. Here's the point. Successful people never stop growing. The moment you stop growing, you have started dying. You've got to continue to grow intellectually. You've got to continue to grow emotionally. You've got to continue to grow especially spiritually. Some of us grow physically without a problem. We need to continue to grow in every other way. Amen. Can I get an amen? amen. I know that was bad bringing it up Thanksgiving weekend. I'm sorry. <laughs> but successful people are always growing. They're always expanding. They're always learning. And here is Paul in all, as an old man in prison. And he says, listen, I haven't arrived. Now that's so different from some people I meet today. I don't know if you've met these people. But I meet people, man, and you're like, man, these guys have absolutely no problems. They're perfect. They act as if they're arrived. They act as if they're perf they've reached sinless perfection. No problems, no doubts. You bring up what you've done, they've done it better. You know what? Those people kind of give me a little bit of indigestion. Because the reality is that no one has arrived. And people that act like they have show me very clearly that they have a long way to go in life. What I've discovered is that the closer I get to Jesus, the more I grow as a believer in Christ, the more I act acutely I see my issues, the more I see my problems, the more I see my imperfections. Because when you get close to the standard of perfection, you cannot help but see your imperfections. Right? And so when we grow close to Christ, and listen, it's not about guilt or condemnation. It's about recognizing I've got to grow. And so what I do is I make sure that I acknowledge that truth. I face my faults. I take an honest evaluation. I evaluate myself. Listen, you celebrate how far God has brought you, but you also acknowledge that you've got a long way to go before you get there. Amen? Amen. Right? Turn to somebody and say, I am not perfect and neither are you. We need to grow. Proverbs 28, 13 says, you will never succeed in life if you try to hide your sins. Confess them and give them up. Then God will show mercy to you. How many need mercy from God? Come on, man. And the only way that I can get the mercy I need is when I give the mercy that needs to be given, right? The only way I can get the grace I need is when I give the grace that is needed. When I get forgiveness, I give forgiveness. Whatever I get, I give. But you recognize, listen, if I try to hide those things, if I try to make believe that I'm all good, I will not, I'll be a failure in the eyes of God. A lot of people are afraid to admit their weaknesses because they're more interested in their having a reputation than in and being successful in the kingdom of God. They're more interested in image than they are in character. But here's what I want you to understand. That transparency is a mark of emotional maturity. When you are transparent in your... I'm not saying that you go out and you air out your dirty laundry everywhere you go. But what I am saying is be real. Be authentic. Be transparent. If you see someone who is struggling with something that you're struggling with, be real about it and say, look, let's, let's get over this together. When you, when you have image versus character, when you, have, when you have a reputation over success in the kingdom, there are times when you have to choose between the two and you have to ask yourself the question, do I want to look good or do I want to be good? You know, today, man, we live in an image-driven society. All you have to do is look on social media. 
I, I, I rarely have seen a selfie of someone who had just gotten up out of bed before washing their face or anything. Usually a selfie is all made up, and then they add the filter, because you got to have the filter, because it's all about what? Image. And that's crept into our lives. Not careful. God's not interested in our image. He's interested in our character, who we are. Not looking good, being good. Amen? Amen. Amen. Here's the question. Here's the question. Everyone, has, this has a self-evaluating question. Here's the first one. What area of my life do I need to change? What area of my life do I need to change? You might want to write this down or take a picture of it. Because if you're going to re rely on your memory, it's going to fail you. Trust me. Now you say, well, there's no area in my life I need to change. Well, then there's an area you need to change. It's called pride. But let the Holy Spirit point it out. I know for me, I could like pick from a whole bunch of them. So I need to just focus on one. Okay, Lord, which one do you want me to work on now? Right? This is the one I need to work on right now. Once I'm done with this one, I'll move to the next one, right? So you honestly evaluate your life. So if I'm going to be successful in God's eyes, I continually evaluate my life. Say that with me. I continually evaluate my life. And the second key to kingdom success is I continually release my yesterdays. I continually release my yesterdays. He said, but one thing I do, forgetting what is where? Behind. Here's what I need to say about that. Stop being manipulated by your memories. Your memories will manipulate you. Your memories will make you say things and do things that God does not want you to say or do. And Paul recognizes one very essential and critical principle here, that if I am going to go and move forward, I need to forget what's behind me. He recognizes, if, if I'm going to be everything that God wants me to be, I cannot waste time on my yesterdays. I let go of my past. Why? Because my past is my past. It's gone. How much can you do to change your past? Nothing. 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 So what do you do? You let go of your guilt. You let go of your grief. You let go of your grudges. I let go of the past so that I can get on with the present. The successful life involves learning to forget. Come on, come on. Turn to somebody and say, you got to learn it. Because it doesn't happen automatically. Isaiah 43, what an incredible scripture this. I love this scripture. I have, I have claimed it many times. It says this. It says, forget the former things. What do you do with the former things? Do not dwell on the past. What, what shouldn't you do in the past? Dwell on it. Look what God says. This is the Lord's words. He says, see, see. Everybody say, see. see. I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. This is the present, right? Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? Man, I could, I could spend a whole hour just on this verse here, on these couple of verses here, because here's what he's saying. If you want to perceive what God is doing, if you want to see what God is doing, the first step to seeing and perceiving what God is doing in your life, when? Now, is to stop dwelling on the past. It's to stop f focusing in on the past. But instead, you forget the past, stop dwelling in the past, and that's the first step for your eyes being open, for your eyes to be able to see, for your heart and your spirit to perceive the new thing that he is doing where, when, now. Now. I know you're like, man, Pastor, I've tried to forget and I can't. And I recognize that. Our brains are made in such a way Listen, everything that you have ever smelled, everything you have ever seen, everything you have ever heard, it is stored in your brain. You may not be able to recall every part of it, but it's there, I promise you. 
How many have ever driven through something or gone somewhere and you get a smell and all of a sudden, boom, you get all these memories from that smell. They're there the entire time, right? And so you, we, there, there is no way that you're going to forget the, the thing that someone has done to you. There's no way you're going to forget the pain that, that someone's brought into your life or, or anything else that you've, that's happened in your life. But here's, here's what biblical forgetfulness is. Biblical forgetfulness is not developing amnesia. Biblical forgetfulness is not allowing the past to affect your present. That's a choice. Why is it a choice? Because you're going to remember you're going to remember. But the choice is, I remember, but I will not allow it to impact me today. I will not allow it to impact my choices. I will not allow it to impact my feelings. My feelings might even be there, but I'm not going to let the feelings impact my decisions, my choices, my actions, how I treat somebody. So don't, you don't let the past control you or have power over you or manipulate you in any way. Listen, 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 listen. The past is important. You know why it's important? Because we learn from the past. We learn from the past, but we don't dwell in the past. We learn from the past without dwelling in the past. Because it's human nature for us to remember the things that we shouldn't remember and forget the things that we should remember. So I said, write it down. Because you, you're not going to remember the things you should be remembering. You're going to remember the things you should be forgetting. <laughs> Can anybody testify to that and say, yeah, yes, amen. Right? It's so easy. It's so easy. You see somebody, you forget every good thing that person has done. You remember all the bad things that that person's done. Paul mentions a couple things that we need to forget. Two things that we need to forget. Number one, I forget my failures. I forget my failures. Too many followers of Jesus just love to continually rehearse the things that they've done wrong. So they rehearse the things in their hearts that God has forgiven and forgotten a long time ago. And it's sometimes it's harder to forgive yourself than it is to forgive others. But we've got to get to the point where we do. Otherwise, what we're saying is, Jesus, your cross, your sacrifice is enough for others, but not for me. And that's an affront to the love and the sacrifice of Jesus. And Satan's favorite pastime is to paralyze you with your past. You're ready to do something for God, man. I can promise you that he will bring up that past thing. And now you can do two things with that. One of two things. You can either say, you know what? That's been forgiven and forgotten. And although I feel it, I'm not going to let this feeling affect what I'm going to do. Or you're going to say, you know what? I'm not worthy and not do it. And you know what Satan will do at that point? He'll give you, he'll give you a slow clap. Because it's exactly what he wants to do with your past. He wants to paralyze you. If he can paralyze you with your past, then he, God can't use you in your future. And he can't do what he wants to do in your life. And I know that sometimes when he comes along and he says stuff like that, you think you're the only one that's ever blown it. <laughs> Come on, look around you, look around you. I promise you, whether they acknowledge it or not, every person here in this house has blown it. How many would acknowledge, in the name of Jesus, I have blown it? Right? Every one of us. There's no one that's not. Listen, there's, every one of us has things in our past that we regret. Every one of us has something that we said or something that we did that we wish we can go back and just tear, turn the, the, the clock back and change what we did. Paul, I'm sure, had regrets. I'm sure there were moments in his life when he remembered holding the coats of the people that were stoning Stephen, the first martyr for the kingdom of God. 
And he probably enjoyed it while he was watching it happen. Because he in his self-righteousness thought, this is doing good for God. This is what, we need to stamp out the evil. I read recently of of Christians praying down fire on the opposite political party. What is that? I'm sure that there's one day when they're going to look back at this moment and say, "How, how, how stupid of me. Paul faced his faults and forgot his yesterday so he can get on with his life. (laughs) How many know we need to get on with life, right? Life isn't going to stop for anybody. You can live in the past if you want, but that's where you're going to stay, in the past. Nothing that you can do will ever change your past. No tears, no regrets, no self-pity is going to change your past. So move on. And the famous words of that prophetess of old, let it go. Let it go. (laughs) Secondly, Paul says, not only do I forget my failures, but I forget my successes. Some people are easily forgetting of their failures because they never had any. (laughs) So all they remember are their successes. But the same principle for our past failures is the same principle we use for our past successes. We learn from them, but we don't dwell in them. We don't stay there. Why? Because if we live in the past successes, if we rest our laurels on all the great things we've done in the past, then friends, we will never do anything more. Because what will happen is this. Pride will begin to take over. Pride will come in. And along with that pride will come complacency. And complacency has never done anything for anyone. You'll stop growing. You'll stop learning. And then eventually you're going to fail. Well, I don't need to learn. Look at all the things that I've done. Who cares? They're done. Learn from them, but move forward. Luke 9, 62, Jesus said to them, anyone who starts to plow and then keeps looking back, come on, say those words with me, keeps looking back is of what? No use for the kingdom of God. You can't drive a car looking in the rearview mirror. Oh, you can but it won't be a long drive. I promise you that. You got to let it go. So here's the question. Here's the question. What memory do I need to let go of? What memory do I need to let go of? Whether it's a failure, whether it's success, there is something that might be holding you back right now from becoming everything God wants you to be. It may be a failure. Maybe somebody else's failure in your life or brought pain or or hurt or something, or it might be a success. You just, every, every conversation somehow turns back to what you've done for God. What memory do you need to let go of? So we continually evaluate our lives, right? And then what do we do? So we release our, continually, because why? Why do we continually do that? Because we have a memory. And then the third key is this, that we learn from Paul's life. I continually focus on my tomorrow. He says, but one thing I do. He says, I forget the past. And then he says this, I'm straining toward, everybody say toward. What is where? Ahead. I press on toward the goal. If all you do is forget the past, then you might just have amnesia. You've got to forget the past, but there's a second step to it. You press on to the future. You go forward. You focus on the future. There's, in the Greek, it's one single priority. This word, this, 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 this one thing actually has an exclamation point. One thing. One thing. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about this, this little word called focus. You hear me say focus a lot. Because we underestimate the power of focus. Focus is key. If you have a river with no banks, what what do we call a river with no banks that just fills everything up? It's just a swamp. It's a marsh. But if you build a river and you use dams, that same river becomes a powerful force that generates power, generates electricity. 
Same thing with light. If you diffuse light, which this light right now is diffused, it just becomes a nice glow and it's nice. And it, but if you take light and you intensify it and focus it, it becomes a laser that will cut right through you. That's the power of focus. And what, what Paul is saying is, and I have learned the power of focus. I have learned to focus on those things that are most important. Because if you don't focus on one thing, you're not going to focus on anything. Your, your vision will be diffused. You know, some of us, we, we, we go through life and it's just, it's like hit or miss. And, and, and maybe we got there, but we don't know if we did because we didn't have the goal in the first place. But a successful person has goals. A successful person understands that God's called me for a purpose. What is that purpose? And I'm going to focus on it. There are a lot of things that I have to say no to because they're not part of the focus that God has called me to. And I have to do that because there are a lot of things that will always draw your attention away. And the enemy will make sure of that. But Paul says, listen, I face my faults. I understand who I am. I continually evaluate myself in the midst of that evaluation. I look at my past and I know there's things that I need to forget in my past, both failures and successes, but then I just can't do that. Otherwise, I'm just going to flow through life. I've got to have something I'm looking forward to. I need to focus on my future. I need to have a clear goal in mind. What does God want me to do with my life? As a father, what's my goal? As a husband, what is my goal? As whatever you're career is what is my goal is it just making money is it just going through life and making it to the end what is my goal what do I want to see my life at when I get to the back when I get to the end that's my future what am I focusing on I love how he says it in first Corinthians 9 Paul was a very a, a sports fan obviously he used sports a lot in his in his analogies and one was here in the Olympic races. He says, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? And then what does he say? Run in such a way as to win the prize. Don't just run. There's a lot of runners in life. Where are you going? I don't know, but I'm tired, man. What are you so tired about? What are you running to? I don't know. I'm just tired. And they run, run, run. There are a lot of people that run. Listen, I go to the gym and people are running all over the place, but they're not moving because they're on a treadmill. <laughs> he says, run in such a way, run with purpose. He says, because I'm running with purpose, the next part of it, he says this, therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. I don't live my life shadow boxing. I got somebody I want to hit. I got something I want to hit. I have a bullseye I'm going to try to aim at. That's success, friends, in the kingdom of God. God doesn't want you just getting tired and not know at the end of the day why you're tired. If you're going to get tired, get tired for a good purpose. Amen run for a reason have a goal in mind now what's Paul's goal ultimately his goal was the same goal every believer in Christ has and that's to become like Jesus right that should be our, a goal that every one of us recognizes we have been predestined to become to become like the son to be conformed to the image of the son that's our destiny but along with that there's also that individual purpose God's given you. My purpose for living is different from yours. My calling is different from your calling. Discover it. Find out what it is. And then run after it. But there's one goal that puts them all together. One goal that is an overarching goal that we need to have in our lives if we're going to be successful in the kingdom of God. And he says what that is in 2 Corinthians 5, 9. He says, so whether we are here in this body or away from this body, our goal, everybody say goal. Now say it like somebody in South America just hit the goal. Goal! 
Some of you are falling asleep. I had to do that. Our goal is to do what? See that goal there? You see that goal? That's the one that puts them all together. If your goal and my goal is to please him, everything will fall into place. There's no more rewarding goal in life than to live your life as an offering of pleasure to Jesus, as an, as an incense to the Father. Father, I want to please you in everything I do. And when we do things that are displeasing to him, we look to the cross. And he starts us all over again. Right? And we don't please him to gain anything from him. We don't please him to try to get, you know, balance the scales so that I do more good than bad. No, no, no. We please him based on what he already, he's already done for us. We please him as a thank you for the wonderful blessings he's poured in our lives, both seen and unseen. So the question here is this one. What am I living for? Amen. <laughs> what am I living for? <laughs> Ask yourself that question. What am I living for? Some of you have never asked yourself that question. Some of you have lived your life and you don't know what you are living for. You're running like a man aimlessly, not knowing where you're going. You're shadow boxing your life away. The successful believer in Christ, the one who is successful in the kingdom of God, understands what he is living for, what she is living for. You need to ask yourself that question. And some of you might not like the answer. Well, I'm living to make as much money as possible. I'm living to, to make my company bigger. I'm living to, to, for pleasure. I just want to please every, everything I do. As long as it brings me pleasure, I'm good. None of that is going to matter anything. I mean, Jack, in the, in the presence of God. You get to the end of your life, you're like, I wasted away my life. I ran aimlessly. Nothing accomplished. And if anything does get accomplished, it's by chance or by the grace, <laughs> the amazing grace of God. So what's your goal in life? What's most important? Because if you don't know where you're going, Nobody else will either. And no one wants to follow anyone that doesn't know where they're going. And here's the last key we learned from Paul's successful life. What's the first one? What's the first one? Come on. Say it back to me, church. Okay. Second one. Third. And here's the fourth one. I continually persevere today. Today. There's only one thing I can do today. Persevere. If I know where I'm going, I just need to be, keep going. If I know where I'm going, I can't let the past stop me today. If I know where I'm going, I just need to keep going today. I continually persevere. Look what he says. Straining, straining. When, when do you strain? Now. Yeah, you've got a goal that you're going towards that's ahead, but I have to strain today to get there. I need to press on today if I'm going to get the goal to win the prize for which Christ has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So that's my goal, but I need to press on today. I need to strain today. What we're talking about here is determination. Absolutely nothing, nothing, nothing worthwhile in life happens without effort. If you think you're going to coast through life, you will coast, but nothing ever coasts forward. Everything coasts downhill. Nothing coasts up. And so what we're saying here is this. Paul says, listen, I recognize that I've got to press on today if I'm going to reach my goal tomorrow. I'm not going to reach it by chance. I'm not going to reach it by, by, by just hanging out and not doing anything. I have to put the effort in today so that I can reap the reward tomorrow. 
And, and you know, you look at most successful people in life. Let's just look at life as a, as a whole, re, regardless of the kingdom of God. But right now, look at people in this world that are successful. Most of them are just ordinary people that, that discovered this little thing called don't quit. And they put the work in. One of my favorite all-time uh, Dolphin players, I don't know if you know this or not, but I'm a, a Miami Dolphins fan. And, uh, and one of my favorite Dolphin fans of all times uh, players of all time was a, a, a guy you might know and remember by the name of Zach Thomas, who played for the Red Raiders. But the reason I just love Zach Thomas is because he didn't have all the natural tools, all the natural talent that everybody else did. He wasn't tall enough. He wasn't fast enough. But he's on the, on the ballot this year again. Hopefully he'll get into the Hall of Fame of the NFL. Why? because he outworked everybody else. He said, you know what? I might not have all this, but I am determined to be the best I can be. And I have to work hard at it. Therefore, I'm going to work hard at it. And he did. And he was successful in his, in his purpose. And he gave glory to God for it as well. But notice the terms he says. He says, I press on. I press on. In the original language, again, taking in the, the, the example of the Olympics, what he is saying is, it's when, it's when you, you're watching a race and you know that you're getting to the end of the race. And what does the runner do? You never see a runner going through the race and just kind of like, what do you see the runner do? They extend themselves. I mean, they, they know that it's going to be a split second between them and first place and second place, right? And so they're not going to just hope they get first place. They strain, they press they overextend themselves. They throw themselves at the finish line so they can win. That's the picture he's giving you here. And he's saying, listen, in life, if you're going to be successful in the kingdom of God, you can't just waltz through life. You've got to extend yourself. You've got to push yourself. You've got to know there's a finish line that you're going to reach, but you've got to, do, you've got to give it everything you've got to get there. Don't let your the past Put a, a weight around your ankle that you can't run, run the race or you're going to finish last. Make sure you know where the finish line is. Keep going. But while you're going there, press, 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 press on, press on, press on. Push. Let me share my life verse with you. This is also Paul's life verse, I believe, because he's the one who wrote it. But look at verse 24 of Acts 20. But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. I've taken that on as my life first because of the calling God placed on my life, but your calling is different. All of us ought to be telling people about the wonderful grace of God, no doubt. Amen? That's what God's called us to be, witnesses. That's why we're on this earth still. But the bottom line is this. We have to have the same attitude Paul had. My life is worth nothing to me unless I fulfill the call God's placed on my life. Unless I do what I'm called to do. Unless I know what my future goal is and press on in that goal. I hate the word quit. It sounds like, it's such a losing word. I quit. No, don't quit. I don't like the word impossible either because all things are possible with God. There are plenty of things in my life. People say, no, don't even try, Nelson. You don't even try it. Other people have tried it. They were not going to. No, if God says to do it, if he says to do it, you know what? He'll give you the power to do it. If he says it's possible, it's possible. Paul said, I'm not going to quit. No matter what happens, I'll never give up. I'm going to give my, my best for God. I'm going to live my life to please him. I'm going to complete the thing that he called me to complete. While I'm on this earth, I have one job. Finish the job. Finish the work that he's given me. The last words of Paul are in the last book that he wrote. 2 Timothy 4, verses 7 through 8. Look what he wrote. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. 
Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to all who have longed for his appearing. He's not talking about heaven. Heaven was purchased for us already on the cross. Heaven was purchased for you 2,000 years ago. He's talking about rewards. He says, man, I want, I'm living for my reward. I want to get some rewards when I get there. God has some crowns in store for me. He has some things in store for me. But the only way I'm going to get those is if I finish the work. If I get to the end of my life and I can say I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith, that's all I want to do. How awesome for somebody to be able to stand in your funeral. And say they did that to the very end. He wanted to have success, but it's not the success this world has to offer, friends. See, one of the things that we often lose sight of is this. We lose sight of the fact that we are living for eternity. We're not living for the here and now. We're living for eternity. And the problem with us is this. See, I want you to understand. I want you to picture this rope as being eternity. This is your lifespan. And this part here, this is your part here on this earth. This is your lifespan on earth. And most, most of us live for this right here. And we ignore that. And the problem is this, that while we are living in this area, there are obstacles. There are things that are going to get in your way. There are going to be things that want to stop you from finishing the race that God's called you to, to run. There are things that you're going to do or others are going to do to you that are going to become an obstacle and going to make you want to quit. And it's in those times that you just have to press on, press through, persevere. You don't need to persevere when everything's going great. You persevere when things are not going great. But if we persevere here, we have the rest of eternity to celebrate in the presence of our God. We don't live for this. We don't live for this. We live for this. This is what matters. We lose sight of this because we're so focused on this. You move on. You press on. And as you do, you have these wonderful promises from the God who always, always keeps his promises. Like Galatians 6, 9. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. You don't give up. You don't give up. You keep going. You keep on keeping on. And if you do, you're going to reap the harvest. It may not be here, but it definitely will be here. In Philippians 1.6, being confident of this, not something we have to wonder or hope. No, we can be confident of this. That he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. That is our promise. We know if we keep our focus on the right thing, on the right person, he will finish that work in you and me. So will you stand with me? Because whatever God starts, he finishes. Some of you are ready to quit. Some of you watching online right now are ready to quit. See, things have gotten pretty tough in marriage that you're in. And you're ready to throw in the towel. No. You know what God's called you to be and do. Don't quit. Press on. 
Keep going. Straining. Is there straining? Yeah. Is it going to take effort? Absolutely. You got to keep going. You reap the harvest at the proper time. So here's the question in closing before we pray. What areas do you need to keep working on? And, and the things that we just covered, what, what are the area? What area do you need to focus on? When was the last time that you sat down and did an honest, personal evaluation of your life? Or maybe you're, you're continuing to allow your yesterdays to control your todays. And you're allowing your past to manipulate you. Do you need to focus on that? Do you know where you're going? Do you know what you're living life for? Or are you just going to run aimlessly through life? Just throw and hope that it sticks. You need to focus on your tomorrow. Or maybe you're here today again and you're tempted to give in, to give up, to quit. Here's what I want you to understand. Then we can do none of this in our own power and strength. That you don't have enough power in you to not quit. There's only one power that can keep you going. And that one power can only be found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Not religion. I won't give it to you. Relationship. It's as we walk with Jesus and the Holy Spirit of God lives in us, he is the one, the same one who raised Christ from the dead, living inside of us, gives us the power we need to overcome the obstacle of today and look forward to the eternity God has in store for us. So will you bow your heads right where you are? What's God speaking to you right now? What's he saying? Is it time for you to surrender to his lordship? Have you been trying to do this religious thing in your own power, but now you recognize it's a relationship that'll give you the real power, a relationship with Christ? It's very simple. It's not complicated. We enter a relationship with Jesus when we acknowledge, number one, that we need a savior. I'm a sinner. I've sinned and I need Jesus as my savior. Secondly, I come to him and I say, be the Lord of my life. What I do is I give up my rights to my life and I give my rights to my life to Jesus. And I say, Lord, here, here I am. You're now the boss. You're the Lord from now on. And you accept the eternal life that he died to give you. As many has received him, to those who receive him, he gave the power to be the sons and daughters of God. Amen. You receive him as your Lord and your Savior. Yes. And you begin to live your life to please him, to please the Father, a good Father that we have. Such a good Father that he gave his only Son for you. So Father, I pray for those right now that are recognizing this reality that they need you as their savior and lord and i pray jesus that you would just come and and do a supernatural work in them right now it's a work that only you can do god it's only you that can give that power i pray that they would allow themselves to focus on you right now and just remove the distractions right now that are going through their minds the enemy is coming right now and he's putting all kinds of thoughts about after church and about things later on today, in the name of Jesus, I pray that every thought would be taken captive right now. And that the focus would be on this eternal moment. Why should we live for now when we have all eternity in front of us? Let there be surrender to happen right now, both here in this house and online right now. In the name of Jesus. Yes. Father, forgive us for our sins. We repent of them. We turn from them. And God, we call on you as our Lord and Savior, surrendering to you. You be the boss, God. You lead us. You guide us. God, I want to live my life to please you and you alone, oh God. 
And those moments when I don't, may I be convicted deeply, Lord. And may I turn right back to you. Thank you for the cross of Christ and the price he paid on that cross. That price was enough for my sins, for all of our sins. Thank you that we don't serve a dead Savior, but we serve the Savior who rose again from the dead on the third day, the resurrected Lord, the one who's coming back one day to reign on this earth. So we believe in our hearts that Jesus has risen from the dead, and we confess with our mouth that he is Lord of all. And based on that reality, we are saved in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now, if you're a follower of Christ right now, where are you? Where are you? Do you know where you're going? Do you know where you're going? Ask God to give you that goal. He's the only one. His goals are the only good goals. Ask him to give you the goals. Maybe he'll show you that your past has been holding you back. Forgive yourself. Let go of the past. Learn from it, but let go of it. Today, right now, let it go. Stop holding on to it. Stop letting it manipulate you. Say that right now. Lord, I let it go. Jesus, I let it go right now. You forgave me. I'm going to forgive myself. I am not going to let my past dictate what I do today. Father, thank you for your goals in life. Thank you for your purpose for living. There's no other, other purpose I want to live for than to please you. And I pray that we would be more like Jesus next week than we were today. In your name I pray it. Amen. Amen. You thankful for God this morning, church. Thankful for his word.